Last week, last week we talked about a tale of two chapters, right? We talked about Rebecca. And as we've been traveling through Genesis so far, we still are in Genesis uh, because we're trying to do our study this year of being women of the word. Not only us being women of the word and studying the word, but learning about the women who are in the word and hopefully getting lessons of both the kinds of women that we should be and the kinds of women that we shouldn't be, right? The good and the bad. Um, It's again the same thing this week. Uh, We have some flawed women, and I love that God was so honest. I really do because they're women that we can relate to. We feel in our own lives that if our lives were written down in the pages of Scripture, we know that God would be honest, that he would not only put our high points but also our low And I don't know, I think it's just good. It's so transparent. You know, we have a hard time sometimes being transparent with one another, uh, especially in this this era of social media, right? And Facebook and whatever, uh, Twitter, TikTok, whatever. You know, you only put your best things forward. Unless, uh, (laughs) okay, so Mark and I like to watch a lot of YouTube anymore. There's just not too many shows that we're in love with right now. So it's like, all right, let's just watch some random stuff on YouTube. And I love America's Funniest Home Videos. I have since I was a little kid and Bob Saget used to host it. Um, There's something about just watching people fail, (laughs) right? Um, Fail armies. There's these these clips on YouTube um, called um, People Are Awesome. And in each of these clips, they take all these different clips from the internet of people doing these amazing things, you know, riding, you know, with one hand on a bike around a block, you know, only their hand balancing, you know, or people jumping over 17 chairs or, I don't know, just people doing amazing tricks and and things where you see them and you're like, oh, but my favorite ones are the ones when they couple the people who are awesome with fail army. (laughs) And so they show one just doing this amazing, you know, twist and turn trick that's just, you're like, oh, And then they show someone falling on their face. And I'm like, you know, even last night I was like, Mark, if I was ever in one of these compilations, I know which half I would be in. (laughs) It would definitely be in the fail army half rather than the people are awesome half. Um, I have talents, don't get me wrong, but they don't involve anything physical. (laughs) Physical abilities are never anything I was super gifted with. Um, Definitely a little more cerebral, um, the gifts that God has given me, but... um, I like, I like watching those, and I feel like the Lord gives us those even in his word. We see these when people are awesome, we see these great things, but then we also see the fail armies. And I think it's because we are, that, that's our story too. The Lord came for failures. He didn't come for the people who had it all together, because the people who have it all together don't need him. He came for us, real people with real failures and problems. And that's why uh, in our scripture we find even more women who, learning their lessons today, we're going to see even more of the kinds of women that we don't want to be and the parts that we want to be. So let's continue our wow study, our women of the word. And tonight it's instead of the tale of two chapters, it's a tale of two sisters. We come into our lesson to the sister, the, the, the sister group that you think of when you think of sisters in the Bible. Um, I think of Mary and Martha. We're going to talk about them later, probably closer to the spring as we get into our New Testament ladies. And I think of Leah and Rachel. These are the two sisters that prominently stick out to me uh, in Scripture. First, uh, we're going to learn two basic lessons tonight in these stories. The first lesson is that a basic, essential need of mankind is affection. You and I need people. We need, and we not only need people, but we need to be loved by people. It's something we seek our entire lives. It's for belonging, for family, for affection from others. Uh, To quote the deeply spiritual movie, Hairspray, they have a song in there with Zac Efron and the girl, I don't remember her name, Tracy Turnblad is her character name, right? It's called Without Love, and it's a scene midway through the movie. But to quote from that amazing movie, uh, part of their song says, Without Love, Life is like seasons without summer. Without love, life is, like, life is like rock and roll without a drummer. Life is like a prom that won't invite us. Or life is like getting your big break and laryngitis, right? 
Without love, life just loses its luster. Um, Leah, the sister we're going to study tonight, the older sister, she suffocates without affection. The problem is she wasn't seeking the right kind. And we're going to talk about that tonight. The second lesson we're going to learn tonight a bit is at, at happiness, how to find happiness, and that happiness is only found in your identity in Christ. Happy, true happiness, lasting fulfillment happiness is only found when you find your identity in Christ, in how much he loves you, in who he is in your life, in what he has to give you, in his plans. We're going to see that in Rachel the younger sister. She was a woman who had everything and nothing at the same time. Oh, pretty interesting. All right, there's your little taste, okay? Let's give you a little background on these sisters. For those of you who don't know their story in the Old Testament, uh, it starts in Genesis chapter 29. You can go ahead and flip there. We're going to read some passages from Genesis 29. Where do we come to? So last week we talked about Rebecca. We talked about her sons, and we ended with kind of her down part of her story when she and her son Jacob deceive her husband Isaac and other son Esau, right? And Jacob steals the blessing from his brother Esau. Well, because of those actions, Jacob needs to get out of town because Esau has no love for his brother right now. He actually threatens to kill his brother uh, once his father dies. He's just going to murder his brother. And uh, Rebecca learns of this, and it's part of their consequences, right, for their deceptive actions. Well, under the pretense of needing to find a wife for Jacob, she talks to Isaac, and they decide to send Jacob away, to send him back to her family. Remember that as we talked about her story last week, the servant that had to travel 500 miles to go find Rebecca and then bring her home? Well, now she wants to send her son out of God's promised land, out of all this area to go find a wife, but really to escape from his brother who's going to murder him. So Jacob goes. He takes this 500-mile journey away from home. It's actually pretty beautiful in the book of Genesis as you read it because God promises Jacob for the first time God speaks to Jacob, and he promises him, hey, I'm going with you. I'm going to go with you, and I'm going to bring you back. And it's just a really neat part. But again, that's Jacob's story. We're talking about this. So he gets into the land. And remember, back then, they didn't have signposts to say, hey, go, you know, 10 miles to this city or five miles to that city. You're at mile marker or whatever. He gets to this well, and he asks the people there, hey, am I anywhere near Haran, this land I'm looking for? And they're like, yeah. And he's like, oh, have you ever heard of Laban? You know, that's my, my mom's brother. His family's supposed to be here. And they go, oh, yeah, that's actually, that's his daughter who's coming right over here right now. There's his daughter. And you see the Lord setting up timing and all that kind of thing. So, Rachel was the daughter that, that Jacob met first. Rachel and her sister Leah are daughters of Jacob's uncle. So this is the family that Jacob's looking for, not only looking for a wife, but also looking for refuge, right? He's looking for a place to stay. Uh, they do have brothers, but the scripture only mentions them as Laban's son said this. So we don't really know much about the rest of their family, but we're given a pretty good picture of Laban, who is a shyster, and then we have his daughters, Leah and Rachel. So let's go ahead and pick up in Genesis 29. We're going to pick up and we're going to read verses 9 through 14. Give you a little, a little picture of when they come in. So now while Jacob was still speaking with them, the people at the well, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, at his mother's, yeah, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. Can you imagine her being like, oh. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative and that he was Rebekah's son. So she ran and told her father, then it came to pass, when Laban heard the report about Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. So he told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for a month. So Jacob is welcomed into this home and he's here. But now he's been there a month. 
Have you ever had family come and stay for a month? <sighs> we all go, oh my gosh, right? Well, you know, they have servants and everybody to kind of help with that. But Laban gets to the point saying, all right, you stayed for a month, you pampered nephew of mine. What are you going to do? Like, you don't just get a free ride in my house. You got to do something, right? Uh, so his journey's successful, and now he's asking him, all right, so what are we going to do? Let's pick it up in 15. So then Laban says to Jacob, because you're my relative, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me, what should I pay you? What should your wages be? Now, he's not just saying, hey, you're doing all this great stuff. I want to pay you back. He's saying, you better get to work. How much should I pay you, <laughs> right? Kind of a, pushing him along. Verse 16, now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now Jacob loved Rachel. So he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter. And Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. We're given this love story, right? This is the first time in Scripture where we see, aside from Adam and Eve, because when, you know, when Adam saw Eve, he was like, whoa, man, right? Woman. Um, he loved her immediately. But since then, most of the marriages that we see were always arranged. Like, they, they grow to love each other, but it didn't start in love. There wasn't love before the marriage in the previous uh, marriages that we've seen so far in the Bible. This is the first one where it's before they're married, Jacob is in, in love with Rachel. In love with her. Rachel, beautiful of form and appearance. There's no maybe it's Maybelline, okay? She's got it, okay? So you think like Audrey Hepburn, you know, these natural, beautiful Marilyn Monroe. I don't know how natural Marilyn Monroe was, but, you know, everybody knows her as iconically beautiful. Um, Grace Kelly, right? Beautiful, beautiful woman, Rachel is. Uh, and Jacob, for Jacob, it's love at first sight. He gives this offer of marriage, of saying, hey, I'll work for you for seven years for her. Basically, I mean, that's an exorbitant dowry, like exorbitant, okay? So not only was he attributing this great value to this girl that he's in love with, but he's also, he doesn't want his offer to get refused. You know, when you're, I don't know if you ever do any sort of bidding or auctioning, if there's something you really want, you don't lowball. You want to make sure that you win that prize. Jacob is like overabundant with his offer so that Laban just, gosh, he would be a fool not to accept it. And he does. He's no fool. He'll take money wherever he gets it. Uh, but it shows this value that he places on Rachel. And Laban accepts. Jacob works for seven years for Rachel. And it seems like only days. I love it. There's, um, if you ever go through dating books or Christian love things. I went through all of them because I grew up as a Christian kid, right? Pastor's kid, I read every Christian dating book that's out there. Um, and a lot of them point to this, and they go in and they say, you guys, look, love waits, right? That's the proof that Jacob really loved Rachel. And if anybody loves you, they'll wait for you. Purity, all that kind of stuff, right? You get into it. Anyway, things get a little interesting here, okay? Here's where the story takes its first twist. In, jump down to verse 21, and it says, he's, Jacob's finished his seven years. Verse 21, it says, then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled that I may go into her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. Now it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. You guys know what that means, okay? I don't need to spell it out. And Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid. So it came to pass in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I serve you? Why then have you deceived me? 
And Laban said, it must not be done so in our country to give you the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week, that means work seven more years, and we will give you this one also for the service which you will serve with me still another seven years. Then Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. So he gave him Rachel as a wife also. And Laban gave his maid Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as a maid. Then Jacob also went into Rachel, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. And he served Laban still another seven years. Okay, so you think, okay, this is so confusing. I do not understand what just happened. Jacob is supposed to marry Rachel. Laban pulls the old switcheroo and puts Leah in her place. And you think, okay, how does the husband not recognize the wrong sister is in his bed? It all has to do with cultural weddings, okay? When a bride back then got married, they were fully veiled. They, you didn't see the bride until you were in the tent at night. And even then, it's night, right? They don't have electricity. It's not like, flick on the light. They did the deed in the dark, and he had no idea. That, and plus... It's a celebration. He was probably a little drunk, okay? So he is, he's not totally in his clear mind. He's out of his head with happiness that he's marrying this girl. The night comes. The veil comes off. He has no clue until he wakes up in the morning, okay? It makes sense culturally that this could have happened, okay? But he is upset. And if you notice, it's the same thing he just did to his father and brother. He played the switcheroo. And now it's being played on him. There's no such thing as karma. Okay, karma is like a Eastern whatever thing. But there is such a thing biblically of reaping what you sow. The Lord allows you sometimes to experience exactly what you did to someone else, so that you know the hurt and the pain, and you can understand forgiveness and getting past it and stuff. In any case, uh, this happens to Jacob. Now he's stuck with Leah and has to work another seven years for Rachel, which he does. He loves her so much that he doesn't give up. He does it again. Now he's able to take Rachel home with him after his one week with Leah. So he gets one week with Leah, then he marries Rachel, then he works another seven years to earn the Rachel that he now has. Okay, So they're married within a week of each other to the same man. Leah only gets to be the only wife for one week. <laughs> Quick note on polygamy. I have in my notes. Polygamy is marrying more than one woman, okay? Or a woman marrying more than one man. You never see that culturally. You only see it the other way unless you watch that old movie, Paint Your Wagon. It's weird, okay? But culturally, at least in Western culture, you never see it anymore. It happens, but in secret. It's not, uh, I think it's still illegal in almost every state is polygamy. Um, it was never God's plan. You never see God condoning it in scripture. You never see him planning for it. God's plan was always one man and one woman. And whenever we manipulate things to make it better for us, it never works. Every time you see a polygamous situation in the Bible, it's always negative, always. It, it never turns out well. Um, as here with Leah and Rachel, it leads to favoritism. It leads to jealousy and strife and bitterness. Um, whatever relationship these two sisters had before Jacob came in the picture, it's shattered from this point forward. They never, you never see them being sisterly. There's one other moment in scripture that they agree on, and it's later when they're leaving Laban's house and going back to the promised land. They're like all for leaving. That's the only thing they can agree on is our dad is a shyster and he's tricked us out of everything and we both are with you, Jacob. We want to leave. That's the only thing they ever agree on, ever. Um, polygamy, it's just not a good thing. I go to Matthew 6, 24. I know God is talking about money, serving money and serving God and how you can't have two masters. But I think it's kind of the same with wives. And not that we're masters of our homes, but we are kind of in a way, right? Just as no man can serve two masters of money and God, no man can serve two wives. He's going to hate one and love the other or love the one and hate the other, okay? It just doesn't work. It's the same in polygamy. Okay, I wanted to give this little note on that. I thought David Gusick made a really good point in his commentary. If you guys are ever reading through scripture and you don't understand something, online, free, available, every single book of the Bible, David Gusick's Enduring Word Commentary. I love reading and then going through his commentary. He has so many really good things to say. He says this. He says, 
Polygamy is not very much practiced in Western culture today. We think we're so beyond polygamy, right? But he says, you know what we do practice, especially in America? We practice serial marriage. And he puts it like this. Picture polygamy is like mass murder. You kill a whole bunch of people at once. So polygamy, you marry a whole bunch of people at once. He said, we do serial marriage, where we don't marry a whole bunch of people at once, but we marry a whole bunch of people one at a time. The divorce rate in our culture, where people are getting married a fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth time, and you're like, whoa. And maybe they don't call it marriage anymore, but they have five and six and seven and eight different partners that they're pretending marriage with. They're playing marriage with these partners, right? And it's where our culture is. He says, we simply multiply spouses, but we do it one at a time. And we think it makes us so much better than this polygamous relationship. We're still trying to do it our own way and not God's. We can't, this is what David Guzik said, we can't do anything about our marriages or relationships that have broken up in the past, but each one of us can choose to do all that we can before God to make sure that from now on, it's one partner for all time, because that is God's way of doing it. I will say that's one thing that Leah and Rachel both got right. They never left Jacob. They both were faithful through all these years of horrendous things that go on. They were both faithful in marriage. That's more than a lot of us can say in our culture, right? Okay, past that. Let's talk about Leah. I put down, looking for love in all the wrong places. That was Leah. Remember that verse back uh, in 2917 where it said, Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance? You think, okay, her eyes were delicate. Does that mean she had like little weak eyes? No. Some people said, you know, she was nearsighted. But I think if you take it in the context of this, people say it's not that her eyes were delicate, it's that she was delicate on the eyes. Like she was not a looker. She is the complete opposite of her sister Rachel. Rachel's the Marilyn, and Leah is the ogre. Okay, I I can't even think of anybody right now that's known for being ugly. I don't want to throw anybody out onto the bus for that anyway. But she is nothing like her. She was not born with looks. She did not have the grace that Leah had of of form and appearance. Um, She's the ugly duckling that never turned into a swan, okay? Um, No one was going to marry her based on her looks. No one. Everyone was waiting for Rachel. No one was waiting for Leah. That's why she's still unmarried, right? And why Laban has to sneak her in to get rid of her so that she's no longer his responsibility. He puts her on Jacob, right? Because no one wanted her. She was not going to find love in a romantic way based on her looks at all. It wasn't happening there. She was not going to find love with her parents. Her father threw her under the bus, literally had to trick someone to marry her just so he could get rid of her. And then later we learn, too, that Laban completely steals Rachel and Leah's inheritance. Like, he has no thought or care at all for these daughters of his. Uh, We don't know what Leah's role was in this deceptive night. We don't know if she was willing to to do it just to get out of her father's house, to have a shot at marriage. We don't don't know. We don't know if maybe she was just obeying her father's commands because back then you did what your dad told you to. Maybe that's too why Rachel went along with it. Imagine Rachel's feeling of knowing that this is her wedding day. This is my day. And now my dad's swapping me for my sister. Like, I mean, she had to feel pretty shafted at that too. It could just be that their dad made them. But the sad thing with Leah is she's not going to find love with a new husband either. She's, she's, gonna, she's walking into a completely loveless marriage. Genesis 29, 30, right? It said it right there. Um, then Jacob went into Rachel and he loved Rachel more than Leah. Always. That never changed. Um, she couldn't earn it. She gave this man 12 sons and a daughter and years of her faithfulness and being there with him. And he, the Bible never once says that Jacob loved Leah, not once. Maybe her deception at the beginning was too much for him to overcome. Maybe she was just that ugly. I don't know. I don't know why Jacob never loved her, but he didn't. Um, At the very end of their story, um, it's interesting that Jacob chooses to be buried with Leah Um, And so some people say, see, he loved her in the end. 
I, I, I don't know. I don't buy that. I think it was more convenience. Rachel died in another area along the way to somewhere, and so she was given a big ceremony and a big, the Bible says he set up a monument to her there. But, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, you never see love here. The Bible never tells us she was loved. But let me tell you something. As you go through Leah's story and you see her constantly like looking for Jacob to love her and trying to get her husband to love her and trying to put herself above her sister constantly, this strife, love was there. It was right in front of her the whole time. I want to read to you, I kind of made a compilation of some parts from Genesis 29 and 30, these two chapters that deal very much with these sisters. And some of the things that it says about God loving Leah, some of these are things that Leah said, some of these are things that the Bible just says about her. It says in parts, when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb. The Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. And God listened to Leah, and God has endowed me with a good endowment. There are many portions where you see that God knew who Leah was and God knew her circumstances and he was doing things in her life to show her that no matter that no one else loved her, he did and he cared and he had compassion. God was good to Leah. You know, even though it was through this weird way that she got married to Jacob, he gave her a husband. She didn't live her life out as you know, the lonely woman in her family's household who no one ever wanted. God gave her primary importance. We talked a little bit when we talked about Abraham and Sarah, about how back then you kind of had the primary wife. You always, you, know, you didn't have two primary wives. You had the primary wife and then maybe some concubines and kind of secondary wives. Leah was Jacob's first wife. So culturally, she was given importance. And then God gave her all these children, he blessed her constantly with children and wealth. Jacob was a wealthy man. As you keep reading this, God was just blessing him hand and foot over with things, which made her a wealthy woman also, right? The Lord can bring comfort and blessing to a wife and can meet her needs even when her, us, her husband can't or when he acts ungodly. I love that we see that in Leah. We see God taking that place. And you know, our culture tells you, if you're not happy, you need to leave because you need to go find happiness. I disagree with that. Maybe you are in an unhappy marriage. Maybe you find no fulfillment in it at all. God doesn't say, all right, go find someone else that'll make you feel better. No, he says, I'll be that fulfillment for you. Don't, you, you can't look for it in a person anyway. Even if you have a good marriage, I'll tell you, it's still not perfect. I love my husband, Mark, to death. He is the best father, and he's such a good husband. But there are moments when I'm like, come on. Like, we are not the same person. We think very differently on things. And when we disagree, we have our moments of, Wah. no one's perfect. And I go to bed sometimes thinking, Lord. And the Lord says, hey, I'm here. I'm here. And I know Mark loves you, and I know you'll make up, and it'll be great. But here's the thing, too. I am here, and I have love for you. The Lord has love for Leah constantly. Love and affection were there for Leah. She just needed to see it. And she did sometimes. When you read through her story, she has moments. Her fourth son, like she, as she names her sons, it gets really interesting when you learn their names. So when you read through it, you got to get that commentary to see what does this name mean? Because back then they named their children after whatever they were feeling at the moment, right? It had more than just a feeling of, I'm naming you Fred Jr. It was gosh, you're such a beautiful kid. I'm going to name you beautiful kid, right? So as she's naming her kids, it's like, oh man, Lord, make my husband love me. And oh man, Lord, I want, look, my husband will really love me now. And then she gets to her fourth kid and she names him Praise. And you're like, ah, there's an interesting turn there where all of a sudden her eyes are on her own position and on her own things. All of a sudden she's praising. She has moments. Leah has good moments where you see her connecting with the Lord and doing some things there. A basic need of mankind is affection. We all need to feel loved. But the truth is, love is there for every one of us. It's there already. No matter your situation or your perceived lack of affection, the Lord is there. And his love 
far exceeds anything the world can offer. I have some verses. I have so many verses tonight, so I'm going to just shoot them at you. If you want them afterwards, I can give you the references. My, one of my favorites, it's one of my life verses, is Ephesians 3.19. Paul says that you would know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. You can't even imagine how much love he has for you. Psalm 27.10 says, When my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will take care of me. And I think that goes for even more than father and mother. I think that goes for husband or sister or whoever, like Leah was dealing with. No matter your situation, Jesus is enough. Quickly, I'm going to flip to Habakkuk uh, because these verses are so beautiful. Oh my gosh, now I put myself in a place of having to find Habakkuk. There we go. It's really tiny. It's, in the, it's still in the Old Testament. It's one of the little minor prophets toward the end. Um, but I want to read you these verses from Hab- Habakkuk. I just think they're so beautiful. In Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19, it says this. Though the fig may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet and he will make me walk on my high heels. I feel like whatever high hills you're dealing with tonight, whatever high hills maybe you're in, when you realize even if there's nothing else there for you and everything has gone dry, the Lord will be your strength and he's there for you and he loves you so much. I wish Leah would have seen it more. I wish we would have read more of that aspect of her in the Bible. And maybe there was and it just wasn't recorded, but truly, truly finding him as your strength and as your love, gosh, it's such a beautiful thing, and it can turn you into such a beautiful person. Okay, so let's talk about Rachel. If Leah's problem was a lack of affection, Rachel's was a lack of identity. She had an identity crisis, and I don't know if any of you have ever gone through an identity crisis where you are so confused about who you are and what your place is in the world. It can be an extremely difficult time. It can lead to all sorts of issues. I think that's where 99% of gender confusion comes from, is because people just don't, they're not comfortable in their own skin, they don't know who they are or where they fit, and they're trying to figure that out. And the world will fit you. The world will find a little mold to squeeze you into and tell you, oh, this is who you are. But the truth of the matter is, we need to find our identity in Christ. For Rachel, as a daughter, that was probably an identity crisis. Her, obviously, she had a dad who was willing to steal her husband from her and give it to her sister <laughs> with no regard for her feeling at all and then throw her in as a bonus to get this guy to work for him longer uh, and then who went on to steal her inheritance. I don't think she had any love for her dad. I don't think she had a relationship with her dad that was a good one. As a sister, betrayed right? Regardless of whether or not Leah had anything to do with this decision, there's no doubt animosity there that she feels towards her sister for taking her night, her wedding, uh, forever to play second wife. She's never, maybe she's more loved, but she definitely is still in the position of second wife forever. She was second daughter, now she's second wife. Oh, I have to say, I'm not second wife to anybody, okay? But I was second daughter, middle child, right? And I always joke with my family that I was neglected and, you know, the middle child, just because I like to play the victim card, but it's not because I actually was. My family all laughs about it. But I have to say, there was something in high school. My sister, Sarah, she is, she's just a firework. She is a, she's a shooting star. Anywhere Sarah walks into a room, the room just lights up. She has this personality where she makes people feel comfortable and she's friendly and she never had a problem ever making friends, wherever she goes. She's just a bright star. And so as she's this bright star in high school, I'm kind of coming up as a little more of a spark plug, right? She's the firework on the spark plug. So I I was still struggling with who I was, you know, all the awkward adolescent stuff. I mean, I was comfortable with who I was in Jesus, but as a person, I was just all over the map. So I I get what Rachel's going through in the fact that now, you know, as Sarah graduated and went off to Bible college, 
there was this vacuum in our youth group where a bunch of the people left that had been kind of the overseers of all the youth group, the older kids, right, the ones you all looked up to. Well, then they all left, and it was like, hey, here's us. And all of a sudden, we kind of found our footing and who we were, and we kind of became the over ones. And poor Megan, she probably had to go through Sarah and me and then found her own way, and she did. She did great. But do you know the feeling of that where when all of a sudden something's removed and now you have a chance to, like, shine? I, I love Sarah, and I loved it when she came back from college. I tell you, we all, all as sisters, we came, became such better friends when we became adults. When we had our own homes and our own space and our own families, and then, like, I don't know, our relationship just got real good because we were out of each other's hair. You know, we had our own lives. I can't imagine getting to that point and then realizing forever my sister will be there. And now she's running my family, and I'm in her. It would have just been, gosh. There's a reason why later in Leviticus, the Bible says you can't marry two sisters. <laughs> if you get married to more than, one, more, more than one woman, that's fine, but you have to pick them from different families. They can't be sisters. I think they're why. But in any case, Rachel's identity as a sister is just bleh, shot. Now, sure, she's the loved wife, but she's also the second wife. And as a mother... Well, that could have been her identity, but it was the Lord held it away from her for a while. She was barren for a long time, kind of like some of these other ladies we've talked about in Scripture. So that identity as a mom did not exist yet. I think she thought that that was the one that she really wanted because we see her pining for it and envious for it. But even when she got it, it, it wasn't it. Rachel was always looking for something. She was beautiful. She has the love of her husband. She's the loved one, the affectioned one, right? She has wealth. Again, she's got it all. And yet, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. As you go through her story, you see her over and over again planning and conniving and coming up with all this stuff and picking on her sister and doing all this stuff. And it's like, just stop. But she doesn't because she's never happy. You never see Rachel happy in scripture, not once. Okay, I was, as I was reading through her story and as I was thinking about it and looking at it, uh, I re you realize the Bible never says that Rachel loved Jacob back. There's this intense love from Jacob for her from the very, very, from the very beginning, but the Bible never says that she loved him back. And I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe this wasn't her plan. Maybe she wasn't looking forward to the wedding. I mean, sure, it's nice to be loved, but maybe she had other plans. She gets shafted too. Maybe she's just unhappy. Okay, all right. But when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. That's what normal people, well, not normal people, that's what happy people do. When, when something comes your way and it's not what you planned and it's not what you wanted, you kind of have to learn sometimes to make the best of it, or you just turn sour, right? Normal people, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. Uh, I like Wanda Sykes, she said, you be unique and you make pink lemonade. Well, okay. Or you learn to juggle, okay? Um, or you just take them, because hey, it's free lemons. That's me right there. <laughs> I don't know what I'm gonna do with them, but they're free, I'll take them. Rachel be like, when life throws you lemons, you throw them right back in their face and you go buy yourself a pineapple, right? But then the pineapple doesn't make you happy. So you get rid of that and you go buy whatever. That's Rachel. She's never happy. Rachel's lemons weren't even that bad. She had love. She had riches. She had, you know, family with her nieces and nephews come in, right? For a time, she thought she needed children. Let's flip over to Genesis chapter 30. That's just the next chapter over. And we're going to read just a little bit of what she has to say about this. Oh, my gosh, Rachel, she is just a brat, let me tell you. I never really liked her. And it wasn't just because she's prettier than me, although that's part of it, right? We have a hard time liking people who are prettier than us. But um, maybe it's just me. Sorry. <laughs> if you're really pretty, I promise I'll give you a chance. But um, Genesis chapter 30, it says this. Now, when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children... Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, give me children or else I die. 
And Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel. And he said, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Jacob kind of digs it a little deeper, but he has a point. Why is she asking Jacob for children? Obviously, Jacob doesn't have a problem having children because Leah has a plethora already, and she has none. She's unwilling to recognize that the problem's herself, and she's unwilling to take the problem to the one person who can help her, and that's God. Jacob's like, I'm not God. Why are you asking me to fill this need? Rachel has needs, and she never learned where to take them. You and I can be unhappy sometimes. It happens. We go through seasons of discontentedness. But where do we take those problems? Do you take them to the bank and get a loan to go buy what you think it was you needed? Do you take them to a man who can't meet that need for you anyway, at least not permanently? No, you take them to the Lord. Jacob has a very good point. But Rachel never does. We don't see her on her knees asking the Lord to open her womb, to give her children, or even just to make her happy. She doesn't do it. Now, her idea, as you continue on in Genesis 30, is to do the Sarah Hagar thing. She says, all right, culturally, I can't have children. My dad gave me this maid. Jacob, you're going to sleep with her, and she's going to have my kids, and then I'll have vengeance, right? So Jacob, okay, I don't have a whole lot of great things to say about Jacob. He's another one of those guys in the Bible where I'm like, come on. But God uses him, and God loves him, and God names him Israel and uses him as like the founder of the whole country. But Jacob be like, okay, I'll take your maid. So he takes the maid, and she has two kids, right? And so Rachel claims those kids as her own. She goes, all right, you know what she names them? Right? We talked about Leah naming her kids praise and you know all this. Good stuff. She names them judgment. And what she meant by that was, look, God's judging you, sister, and I get to have kids. She means it totally spitefully. So she names her first kid judgment. Then the second kid that her maid has, she names him wrestle. And it's I was wrestling with my sister and I win. I win. Right? It's all about her. But does it work? No, because Leah goes, hey, guess what? I have a maid too. Jacob goes, okay. And so he sleeps with that maid and has two more kids, right? And, and Leah's like, look, I got a troop and I got a treasure and all this stuff. And she's just happy as can be. And now Rachel realizes, oh, that didn't work, right? No, because when you're striving to make your own happiness, it's never going to work. It's just not. And it doesn't work for her either. So it wasn't enough. Leah copies, gives Zilpah to Jacob. He has two more sons. And then she has two more of her own and a daughter. Now, if I were God, praise God I'm not for all of you, let me tell you. But if I were God, I'd be done with Rachel, this girl who just doesn't care a whit about me or seeks me for anything. Truly, and God knowing the future, he knows that in the next chapter she's going to go steal her dad's idols and like be all deceitful and keep those. I mean, she just, she, she doesn't get it. I'd wash my hands of her and walk away. But let me tell you what, that's not our God. Our God is so gracious and he's so good. And I love the verse in the Bible that says he sends the rain on the just and the unjust. When we were having all those crazy fires this summer, it was like, Lord, I know we don't deserve it, but send your rain. And he did, right? He's so good to us even when we're not good to him. He is faithful when we are faithless. In any case, if you jump down on chapter 30 to verse 22, it says, oh, I jumped too far. It says, then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. Now, I personally don't think Rachel was talking to him. I think he just heard her talking to everyone else. And he listened, and he opened her womb. And she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. That's what Joseph's name means, is, Lord, give me another one. She's barren all these years. She has a baby boy. You'd think that it was finally what she'd always been waiting for. And she names him, may God give me another one. What, was he not handsome enough? Was he a fat baby? I don't know. (laughs) My sister-in-law is so funny. She always had this fear that she was going to have ugly babies. 
right? She's full-blooded South Korean. She was adopted when she was little, and my brother is Hispanic, right? And so she's like, our babies are either going to be super cute or they are going to be the weirdest looking kids on earth, right? These Mexican-Korean babies. Let me tell you, they are the most beautiful children on earth and could be in the front of any magazine. But when Gwenny was first born, you know the trauma of birth? I've never seen a baby who like is, except for my three, they were gorgeous, but most babies, when they come through the trauma of being born, they're a little funky, right? We laughed at Brayden. When Brayden was born, they had to use like the suction cones. So he had this weird cone head thing going on for a couple of days. And Corinne came out with a smashed nose. Like you see the picture of her and her nose is just pushed up against the side of her. But then you see these babies and they're just precious, right? But every baby, you, like you never take baby pictures the day they're born. You wait and take them about a week later when their cheeks are kind of filling out and they're, that's how my sister-in-law's daughter Gwenny was. She's like, oh, she looks like Popeye because her head was kind of swollen and her eyes are kind of, oh my gosh, so she was the cutest baby after about a week, right? She had to get through it. So I don't know if Rachel was like, my baby's ugly, I need another one. But in any case, the baby didn't do it for her. That wasn't the thing that made her happy. It wasn't. She just said, may God give me another one. <sighs> Now, God did give her another one. He gave her her heart's desire. And the worst thing, you guys, is when we have something, our heart's so set on something, and God gives it to us, most of the time it's nothing like we thought it would be. It sours in our mouths instead of gives us happiness because God knows the thing that we really need to be happy is just him. He gives her another son, and she dies giving birth to him. Now, she tries to name him son of my sorrow, like, I'm dying, and I'm sad, and I hate you, and I'm naming you son of my sorrow. But her, his father, Jacob, changes his name to son of my right hand, which meant, like, son of honor, right? He names him Benjamin, my precious Benjamin. And, and she wanted to name him differently. The point is, though she doesn't live to see it, God was gracious to her there, too. God gave her these sons. Joseph, of course, the may he grant him another. Joseph turned into be the savior of of Israel, right? As you go into this story, his story takes up 10 chapters in Genesis, and he gets sold by his brothers, their envy, their favoritism, all those things that they saw their moms go through, the boys go through. They see all these things happen, and they sell Jacob and they ha or Joseph, and they have these evil purposes for him, but God uses it for good, and he uses it to put Joseph in a position to save them from this famine that comes, right? He saves their lives, and God uses this gracious thing. And Benjamin, precious Benjamin, this favored youngest son of Jacob and um, uh, Rachel, right? It's, it's his youngest. He goes on to be one of the tribes of Israel. And God does amazing things through him too. Um, God is so gracious, but Rachel never saw it. She never saw it. I pity Rachel. I pity her. I don't hate her. I used to hate her because I was like, oh, she's this pretty awful brat. But I pity her now when I read her story. She never found her worth and her purpose and her happiness in what she had been given by the Lord or in the Lord himself. I want to read you a bunch of verses, okay? 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 7 says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. Contentment is something that is grown in us. Some children are born contented. They're pretty happy to play with themselves. They're happy with whatever you give them. But as they get older, you know, they learn to take things and whatever. I think contentment has to be relearned, and it's something that has to be practiced by us. Being content with what we have with our husbands, with our homes, with our children, with our jobs, with our churches, truly with our gifts, with our bodies, right? You learn to be okay with what God has given you. And not just okay, you learn to be thankful. You learn to see all these things that God has given into your life and you realize, God, you're so good. Psalm 34, 8 through 10 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. 
The young lions shall lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. And sometimes it's not because God gives you a new good thing. It's because he opens his, your eyes to the good thing that he's already given you. Have any of you ever remodeled a house and you get one thing done and you're like so excited because you got that one thing done and then you're like, next is this and next is this. We bought a remodel like eight years ago. And so it's been, we didn't have all the money in the world to do like the fixer upper and do it all in one go and get to move into this beautiful brand new house. We spend all our money buying the house, right? And so slowly but surely over these eight years, we've been able to do little things in our house to get them there. My brown tiled 70s bathrooms now aren't as ugly as they used to be. I mean, they're now beautiful. We've been able to rip those out and put in new bathroom stuff. And then just this year, we were able to stucco the outside of the house. So the inside's been working on for, you know, eight years, but the outside was this, oh, it was just ugly. But this year, we finally got to stucco it. But I tell you what, it's amazing. As soon as that's done, I'm planning the next thing. And I'm like, now we got to get new doors in all the whole house. I want new doors. I want them pretty. You know, we just have these hollow core doors that, you know, they're plain. And I'm like, okay, and then, oh, I would love to get this, and I'd love to do that. And if you let yourself go down that path, it's a little danger of watching remodel shows, right? Because it's not always just about seeing what other people do. It's, oh, I wish I had that, and I wish I could do this to my house. And, uh, and then it's, oh. And then by the time you get the house exactly where you want it, that decade has passed you by, and now pink is no longer in. I remember my mom at my house. We had a pink stucco house that I grew up in. And she sponge painted, you guys remember sponge painting? She sponge painted the kitchen blue and pink. It was like a baby shower, threw up in my kitchen, okay? But my mom loved it, and she had these pinks and blues all over. I tell you what, today there's not a single pink or blue thing in my mom's house. Why? Because time has changed. And now I've got to go from this color to this color and this style to this style. And if we let ourselves, we'll never find happiness in those things because it's not there. Happiness is in what you already have, finding contentment in the Lord. You guys all know Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And it doesn't mean you don't want him. It means you want for nothing because he's your shepherd. Oh. And last one I have for this is Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He is always with us, and he is our contentment. I pity Leah for seeking affection elsewhere when the Lord was right there the whole time. Psalm 138, 18, the Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. James 4, 8, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Psalm 139, 17 through 19, how precious are your thoughts to me, O oh God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. That's how many thoughts he has toward us. When I awake, I am still with you. Last one is Lamentations. Lam not lemonade, Lamentations. 322 through 23 says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I'm going to give you that one again. Lamentations 3, 22 through 23. Actually, the whole rest of that chapter is just oh, all on God's faithfulness and his love being steadfast. These sisters fought. They stewed. They complained. They desperately tried to fix things for themselves. And neither of them found peace ever in their own efforts. Leah experienced moments of it when she turned her eyes to the Lord, but not enough of it. Rachel never had it. She had everything else, but she never had God's peace and surety in who she was in him. Truthfully, it affected more than just them. You go on to read their story and you read about the poison that their envy and favoritism had in their boys. Their boys lived out their same bitter strivings, their same envy, and oh, ladies, your discontentment and striving and refusal to give it over to Jesus will both affect you and those closest to you. 
especially if you have kids. They're watching you. And if they never see you happy with a finished job or something done, they're never going to be happy with the next thing. If you're always moving relationship to relationship, they're always going to move relationship to relationship because they will copy you. Oh, Lord, next time I find that, oh, I need this. You know, I always, I always point it out to my kids. You have the kids as you go through the grocery store, and they're like, Mom, can I buy this? Mom, can I have this? Mom, can I have this? No, even if you have your own money, no, we're not here for that right now, right? And I'm always getting on their case of, you guys, you have 4,000 stuffed animals. Why do you need to buy another one? But then the Lord goes, Andrea, you have doors and windows and candles and, you know, more bedspreads that a person has a right to have in their house. Why do you need another one? Because this one has snowflakes and it's flannel and it's, gosh, it just goes with a new car. Andrea, be content with what you have. It's not a popular Christmas message, let me tell you. Because right now, right, the scare right now is, you guys, there's going to be no Christmas presents left if you don't go get them today. The shipping containers, they're going to hold it all till February. You won't be able to buy your children the whatever, whatever. Go shop today. Go shop now. Go get it because it's not going to be there. And we get these frenzies, right? Do you guys remember last week when Walmart closed down for a day? Everyone freaked out. Like we didn't have three other grocery stores and a Target and a Murdoch's and Office Depot. We have everything. Why? There was a panic. If you looked at the Montrose message board at Facebook at all, it was, why is Walmart closed? <gasps> what are we going to do? Well, Walmart closes at 2 o'clock today. And then I heard someone that went on Friday or Thursday morning or whatever it opened, and it was like, he's like, it was a madhouse. There was like 200 people just at the entrance part. And it's like, why? I cannot believe that that many people were out of toilet paper. I can't believe it. We all stock up now from the scare from last year, right? There's no way everyone that was at Walmart needed something that morning. But it's the panic. It's that seeds of discontentment. You're going to miss out on something that someone else has, right? Oh, you guys, that we would realize and find our peace in the Lord. Beautiful or plain, we all have our problems. We need to stop looking at ourselves or at how God deals with others and instead put our eyes on Jesus, right? Like Jesus told Peter, you follow me. I don't care what John does. You follow me, right? Ladies, you follow Jesus. Find yourself in him. His affections for you are great. His peace and his plan and his purpose are waiting for you to just look up. Lord, I'm here. I got gotcha. you, right? I have one more verse to read to you tonight, and we'll close. It's Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. It says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's your identity. It's in Christ now. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Let's pray. Lord, I love these sisters that you gave us. I love that Leah had her moments, Lord, of seeing you. I love seeing your faithfulness through these stories, God, because I know that you will be faithful to us too. God, open our eyes to your great affection. Father, when we need to feel loved, when we have that human desire to be wanted and to be needed and to be cared for, open our eyes to see that you are standing right there, ready to hug us, ready to love us, ready to fill our hearts, God, with more of you. You're the love and the affection that we need, God. We're not going to find it here. It's only in you. Open our eyes to it, Lord. And Father, like Rachel, would you just Help us to find our identities in you. Jesus, not in our houses or our things or how many cars we drive or how beautiful we are. Lord, our identity is in who you are in us. Remind us of that, Lord, as we go through the holidays and as we, you know, have family in town and all these things happen, Lord, the busyness of the season. May our eyes be on you so we don't miss out on you like Leah and Rachel did. Keep us in you, Jesus. And thank you for using them anyway. 
Thank you for blessing them and using them in your story. Um, you're just such a good God. We love you, dear Jesus. Amen.